not Ukraine. It's Ukraine as a part of NATO. NATO is the most violent, aggressive alliance in the world. Here, we talk about it as a peacekeeping alliance. Really? Serbia, Iraq, Libya. What's the peacekeeping alliance? This is just recent years. NATO is a violent, aggressive alliance. Remember that NATO is the North Atlantic has recently been expanded to the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. They're part of the North Atlantic now. The last NATO summit, uh, its mission was extended to the Indo-Pacific region. The idea is to enlist Canada, Europe in the US campaign against China. Actually, you could Vladimir Putin, apart from the criminality of the invasion of Ukraine, was also an act of criminal stupidity from his point of view. Drove Europe into the pocket of the United States. Europe has other options. The natural commercial trading partners of Europe are to the east. The German-based industrial system in Europe, which has been very successful, is highly reliant on resources from the Russia's. It doesn't have much of an economy. It's about the level of Mexico, but has enormous rich resources, not just petroleum, but also minerals. And also, it's a path to the huge China market, which is the EU's largest market. That's their natural alliance. It's been a long issue right th through the Cold War, whether Europe should become an independent force in world affairs with interactions with the East, or should it be in Washington's pocket under NATO? Putin solved that problem, gave the United States its fondest gift on a silver platter, Europe. Europe's suffering for it. They're declining, may, may even deindustrialize. The United States is doing fine. I mean, it's the Ukraine war is an immense gift to the United States. It, it's, it's so plain that it's even discussed in high circles that a small fraction of the colossal U.S. military budget, it's seriously degrading its only military competitor. And that's a bargain. The Russian military is severely uh, harmed by the war cost the United States almost nothing. Europe's back in Washington's pocket. Fossil fuel industries, military industry are just ecstatic over uh, the huge profits that they're gorging with. Military industry has uh, new markets opening up as they show off their weapons in Ukraine. From every point of view, it's a huge bonanza for the United States. For the rest of the world, quite different. Ukraine itself is being devastated, along with partially Russia. Uh, countries of the global south are suffering from the curtailment of grain and fertilizer resources from one of the main producers, the Black Sea region. The whole world is suffering from the fact that the limited steps towards dealing with the climate crisis are being reversed. For years, it's been a standard demand on the left that we should disband NATO or Canada should pull out of NATO. But recently, it's become much more difficult to, to make that case. I mean, elite opinion in Europe and Canada has shifted even more dramatically in favor of the alliance. And even in long-term NATO holdouts like Finland and Sweden, the tide has turned and there's a big push to join the alliance. And as you said, join all that, the military spending to join the NATO activities, to join the expansion and so on, and to sort of submit to the the U.S. leadership, as it were. So I guess my question is, what do you think that activists or anti-war groups should be saying about NATO in the present context? Well, they should be telling the truth. That's what the left should be doing. Truth is that uh, Putin did give Washington a tremendous gift. He gave a pretext for NATO to not only exist, but expand. Uh, the Finland-Sweden case is quite interesting. Finland and Sweden are under absolutely no threat. I mean, they're just 
gloating over the fact that the Russian military is so weak it can't conquer uh, cities a couple of kilometers from the border. All of a sudden, they're going to attack major military powers like Finland and Sweden. It's beyond comical. What's actually happening in Finland and Sweden, here's what the left should be talking about here. They both have quite advanced military industries, sophisticated advanced military industries. They're already partially integrated into NATO. They join the NATO exercises and so on. They fully join NATO, great markets and prospects for advanced military industry in Finland and Sweden. They can move on towards becoming more militarized right-wing societies uh, uh, now integrated with the uh, military-based military NATO system. Big shot in the arm for the right wing and the military in both countries. That's Sweden and Finland joining NATO. Is Canada being defended by NATO? Who's being defended by NATO? Nobody. I mean, in fact, one very good East European historian, Richard Sakwa, an England British historian, pointed out a couple of years ago that NATO exists mainly to deal with the consequences of its existence. It's the NATO expansion to the borders of Russia that were the provocation that led to the invasion of Ukraine. Didn't expand, you wouldn't have an invasion. In fact, the crucial issue up till almost days before the invasion was, can Ukraine be neutralized? No Russian leader is going to accept Ukraine right in the geopolitical heartland of Russia to be a couple you know, a couple hundred kilometers from Moscow over an open plain scene of invasions. They're not going to allow it to be heavily armed as part of a hostile military alliance. Not a single Russian leader would ever tolerate that. And it was the insistence up, up to the end, Putin was saying, insist on a neutral Ukraine, move towards the Minsk agreements. No reaction from Washington, not our business bill expand as we like. If China wants to bring Mexico and Canada into a hostile military alliance aimed at the United States, that's fine. There's no objection, I'm sure. I'm curious, do you think it's silly for Russia to to feel threatened by Ukraine on its border? I mean, given that it's a nuclear power. Not just a nuclear power. It's not Ukraine. It's Ukraine as a part of NATO. NATO is the most violent, aggressive alliance in the world. Here we talk about it as a peacekeeping alliance. Really? Serbia, Iraq, Libya, what's the peacekeeping alliance? This is just recent years. NATO is a violent, aggressive alliance. They have heavy weapons in this century, 2000. Uh, one of the things that the United States did, which isn't discussed enough, is starting with George W. Bush, the second Bush, has been dismantling the arms control regime, which was steadily established with difficulty over 60 years. Uh, Bush dismantled the ABM treaty. It's very serious for Russia. It means putting uh, anti-ballistic defenses so close to the Russian border, Romania and so on. I mean, the pretext was you have to defend Europe against non-existent Iranian missiles. Well, you're Canadian intellectual, you can maybe buy that story. Everybody else in the world left. Uh, but uh, these ABM installations are first strike weapons. Every strategic analyst knows that. They have no conceivable possibility of defending against a first strike. Conceivably, they could deter a second strike, a retaliatory strike, which makes them first strike weapons. Furthermore, they can easily be reconfigured to have missiles, nuclear missiles aimed at Russia. This is right near the Russian border. That's the ABM treaty. Then comes along Trump, eliminate the INF treaty, the Reagan-Gorbachev treaty. That means a short range missiles in Europe, 10 minutes flight time from Moscow. They move to Ukraine, traditional invasion route. You take a look at a map, flat terrain right to Moscow and St. Petersburg. 
uh, which our Germans went through there twice in the last century. Uh, of course, no Russian leader is going to allow it to be part of a hostile military alliance. So in the past, you've said that obviously you support the right of Ukrainians to defend their territory. And, and you've said that the military aid is on the one hand provocative, but on the other hand, justified to an extent and that it has to be carefully calibrated, I think was your words. Where do you feel like the calibration is at right now? Well, as I've written, I think up until recently, it's been pretty reasonable. It was defensive weapons, but it's now going up. I mean, now it's been acknowledged by, in public, Washington Post had a long story about it, but it's been acknowledged by the U.S. military that the U.S. so-called advisors and personnel, in other words, are actually directing much of the fire of the uh, advanced missiles like the HIMARS and so on. It's now going up to tanks. It's now just recently moved up to jet planes. Where's it going to go next? Russia recently, you've read about this, announced that they might consider putting tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. That's very dangerous. But why are they doing it? I think it's almost certainly a warning to NATO, to the United States, saying, if you keep escalating, we're going to react. I mean, notice that Russia has not yet seriously hit Western Ukraine. Joe Biden went to visit Kiev. Janet Yellen went to visit Kiev. How many foreign leaders do you remember going to visit Baghdad? when the United States and Britain were smashing it to pieces. Not only didn't they visit it, uh, peace uh, activists were pulled out of the country. To, inspectors were pulled out of the country so they had a chance to survive. Uh, this is a very different kind. It's not a British-American kind of war yet. It doesn't go after and destroy everything. Could could expand to Kiev, to Western Ukraine, to supply lines run into NATO supply lines, you're moving up the escalation ladder, you can move up to terminal war with not much difficulty.